So it's the state of the university and every year I try to come up with some theme that we can thread through the presentation so that you can see from beginning to end that we're trying to talk about the same thing. And, and this year we decided it's, it's a year of celebration. Uh, so many things to celebrate this year that we've, uh, that we've accomplished and that we're going to be experiencing this year. So, so that's the, the theme of it. And celebrations usually happen around anniversaries or birthdays. So we have these four anniversaries, birthdays, that are coming up this year. Harper Decker School of, Nur School of Management and the Women's Athletics uh, Program. 50 years for women in athletics, 50 years for the School of Management, 50 years for the Decker School of Nursing, and 70 years, where's Elizabeth? 70 years for Harper College, so. <laughs> Happy birthday. And we always like to have an update on how many students we have. Uh, as of yesterday, 18,105, we count heads. Uh, 3,958 graduate students on our way to getting someday 6,000 graduate students here. And we have some ideas of how we're gonna move in that direction. 14,000 and change undergraduates, that's the goal. That's where we wanna stay. That's the capacity, really, of this campus, is 14,000 students. And you don't wanna grow bigger than what your capacity is. And did you know that the first semester, as you're walking around, that one out of every third student is brand new. I mean, we bring in about uh, uh, 5,000 new students, we have 18,000 students, but one out of every three students is brand new. You don't realize that, but I always tell people, say hi, this might be your new best friend. And staff, the, the staff hiring every year brings hundreds of new staff on campus. So I want to welcome all the new faculty and staff that are here. Uh, if you've never been to one of these before, it's not too long. We'll be done in 30 minutes, I promise. But we had some really big things to celebrate this year. Unbelievable things. Where's Kevin Betcher? We won three rounds of Jeopardy. Kevin, I'm sorry to tell you, you're now on the second page. <laughs> we won the Nobel Prize. I've threatened to carry this around with me for the, until we win the next Nobel Prize. I've also told my wife I'm not shaving until we win the next Nobel Prize either. So we've got a lot, we've got a lot of work to do to get that next one. Uh, and what a great man. He's not here today. He's a little busy these days. He's actually giving a lecture over at the ITC to a group of local companies on the technology innovations that are happening at Binghamton University and in, in the Southern Tier. What a, what a generous guy. He just won the Nobel Prize and he's, he's giving a lecture to a, a couple hundred local, local company members. But you read some of the interviews that, he's, that he talks about how Binghamton was this inviting place, a collegial place. There's not fiefdoms. He left Exxon in 1988 knowing that he did not want to be a manager and that's the track that they had put him in and that he wanted to be a scientist. And he chose Binghamton University because he saw something here that he didn't see at a lot of other universities. So I think his story, as we start to think about our accomplishments, his story and how he views Binghamton University has a lot to do with the success of the university. <clears throat> I look back at Harper, one of our favorite pictures here of our, our Harper students in 1950 carrying their chairs from classroom to classroom. They really did do that. I met somebody in Florida who did do that, carried his chair. I said, why did you carry your chairs? Because there weren't enough chairs and you never knew if there was gonna be enough chairs in the next classroom, so you just brought one in case. <laughs> and the dress, I love I the ties too. Just, just a bunch of, of things that we pulled out of the timeline for, for Harper. Started in 1950 as the Harper College after it had been triple cities for about four years under Syracuse University. Might have been closed, but New York State said, no, let's keep it open and let's give it a name, call it Harper College. A really cool decision. That's why we had 50 faculty on day one and 500 students on day one because triple cities had been there. Uh, we moved to the Vestal campus 10 years later. 
Graduate education began very quickly after that. Uh, we became SUNY at Binghamton, and then later on we became Binghamton University, or at least our informal name. Uh, and we've been moving around, expanding Harper College significantly. But again, just, just a few highlights along that journey. 26 departments, 16 interdisciplinary programs, and 22 masters and doctoral programs. The core of the university, the heart of the university. The most integral part of our success is because we keep that at the core. You don't become a highly ranked public university just because you do what everybody else does. You focus on something that no one else does and you do it excellently and you keep that core of the liberal arts education at the center of not just the students in Harper College, but the students in all of the colleges at Binghamton. School of Management, 50 years, just a kid. Uh, some steps along the way there, School of Business in 1970, 71, renamed to the School of Management. They moved into their home in Academic A in 1998 started their executive MBA program in 2006. And just the highlight that I love to go to every year is the Brilloff Lecture. And I got to listen to Maggie Chan Jones, uh, class of 96, talk about her experiences in, in, um, in industry. And lots of accolades, lots of rankings. And we'll throw some rankings up a little bit later about the whole university. But we always, always do well in rankings when there's a cost part of it, a value part of it, and the school of of management definitely does that. But the one that doesn't have cost effect uh, on it is the number one provider of new recruits for EY and PWC. Number one in the nation, Binghamton University. All the schools. It's a great, great accolade. Decker School of Nursing, 50 years, 1969, first class, 20 students. It's gotten a little bit bigger, but not tremendously bigger. 650 students, probably about 400 undergraduates and 250 graduate students. Um, and I'm sorry, 200, 240 master's and doctoral students, 650 undergraduate students. The health and wellness programs were moved there in 2012, and the big news for them is they're going to have a new home. They're going to be moving to Johnson City, into the Endicott Johnson shoebox factory, and I want to thank our geography department for all the work that they've been doing to, to map and to monitor and to record the changes that are occurring in Johnson City. It's a story map. If you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, story map, Binghamton University, Johnson City. And it has some videos and some graphics of the things that have happened over the past four years while we've been expanding our footprint in Johnson City. But our journey as a university started at the core, kept the core there, started at a couple of professional schools, uh, CCPA evolved, TLEL evolved, they grew out of the programs that were established in the 1960s, the engineering school in 1983, uh, the school of pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences in 2017. Did I say that Stan Whittingham won the Nobel Prize yet? <laughs> you might see him a couple of more times on these slides. And then 2020, the health sciences campus will be opening in Johnson City. So we use this term, the premier public. Right? We see it in, in um, our advertisements. We see it in the rankings books. They call us the premier public of the Northeast. But what does it mean and why are we talked about like that? I think it comes back to the things that Stan has said in his interviews. It's the collegiality. It's the camaraderie. And that comes with excellent people. We have excellent faculty, just a couple that were promoted to the rank of distinguished professor this year, Nkuru and Chat, uh, distinguished professor and distinguished uh, teaching professors. We have 60, 56 Binghamton faculty who are at the ranks of distinguished professors. Uh, and that's the highest rank that SUNY will, will allow and, and will give. But it's, it's not just their excellent in research or their excellence in teaching or their excellence in service, it's how they collaborate. It's how they work together. The fact that we were able relatively easily, relatively smoothly to create the transdisciplinary areas of excellence, which in most campuses would have been fought, uh, we embraced it and we have done a great job of adding faculty around those areas when appropriate. Uh, but it's that quality faculty members. And what attracts great faculty? Other great faculty and a sense of collegiality, and great students. And so it's this cycle. You get good students, faculty want to be here as, as their teachers. You get good faculty, students want to be here as their mentees. Uh, and uh, just recently, Jasper Bauer, who was working on the drone uh, locating of uh, buried landmines 
and won a Goldwater Scholarship Award this year. Rankings. We love rankings when we do well, and we tend to do well in all the rankings. Uh, we moved up one spot in U.S. News and World Report, both at the public level and at the um, all university level. So we're number 31 in the top 50 public universities and probably the only one in the top 50 that people can't spell our name. So did you see, did you see the Wall Street Journal's article on Stan? They spelled Binghamton with a P. <sighs> Killing me, they corrected it. So it's been corrected, but you know, how can you be ranked and people can't even spell your name? I think that's pretty cool, actually. Um, but then some of the other ones, and when they start to put in factors of, of cost, you know, uh, number 33, public and private, for uh, colleges, for your best colleges for your money, for Money Magazine, the top 10 best buy public colleges in the United States by Fisk, the top performer in social mobility, as ranked by US News and World Report, 16th best public college in the nation by Business First, number one in 16th best public university in the United States. I like Business First. They're, they're very generous with that. And our first national championship, we are number one, we are the top ranked university in the country with regard to research related to sustainability. And that was designated by the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, ASHI, which does, which collects all of our data, all university data every year, and looks at how green their footprint is, but then ranks them on different categories. And we were ranked number one in research. Now, when you go to the website, you will notice that we were tied with four others for number one, but they listed them alphabetically, and because we are Binghamton University, not SUNY Binghamton, we were number one on that list. So, good change in name. Some really cool things happened last year in, in our faculty's research. Diane Miller, Somerville, her, her book on suicide tendencies for Civil, civil War veterans and the research that she did to, to try to discover evidence of PTSD in, in warriors of the Civil, civil War almost won the Gilder Lehman Prize, the, uh, the prize that goes to the best book each year related to the, to the Lincoln era. And our Institute for Global, I'm sorry, Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention held its second conference, inter, an international conference, 14 14 countries represented, over 150 people at that conference, uh, four continents represented, and talking about some of the really hard issues about genocide and mass atrocities that are occurring daily in countries around the world. And, and it's been widely supported by some of our alumni with donations as well as an anonymous donor who's, who's contributed significantly and generously to the creation of that. The Human Rights Institute was launched, David Signorinelli and Allie Moore. We launched the Human Rights Institute, a great program, something that our students really want to understand in more depth. The Decker School, $2.8 million grant for rural nurse practitioner training, a big win for the Decker School. I don't know if Mario's here, but Mario has been doing a great job advancing the research activities of our, of our faculty in Decker. And related to research, our first year research immersion program has been growing. I don't know how many we're up to now, Don. How many students do we have in? 300 plus students in the first year research immersion program. And this year we started the SOURCE project. And the SOURCE project is students working in the humanities under the guidance of faculty who are helping them do a first year experience in research. A unique opportunity, a unique offering that a lot of universities cannot afford to do. We can't afford to do it but we have faculty who want to do it, who are dedicated to it. Even Stan Whittingham has taught in this program. Some more research accolades this year. We became Carnegie R1, which is very high research classification. When this came out, I said, well, is there, is there a very, very high <laughs> research category? No, no, there's just one very high, top of the deck, R1. It's a combination of PhDs granted and research expenditures it's a great group of people to be in, about 120 universities in that list, and we want to stay there. It's important to stay there. Research expenditures tipped at, uh, topped at $48.6 million for the 18-19 academic year, uh, and it's continuing, continuing to grow, and we anticipate it to cross $50 million this year. Uh, I don't know if Lewis Piper's here, but Lewis won a National Science Foundation 
uh, major research instrumentation grant, a $1.2 million grant to purchase a one-of-its-kind piece of equipment. So it's, a piece, it's a piece of equipment that analyzes materials and tells you what's inside of them, basically, and can be done at a scale that can help us improve the technologies around, guess what, lithium batteries, because Lewis is one of the researchers in that group. Uh, we started and advanced a Center for Heterogeneous Integration Research Packaging. This is a partnership with the Semiconductor Research Corporation sponsored by companies and uh, some other universities. I think Purdue is involved in that as well. We also won a Center for Advanced Technologies from New York State this year. We now have two CATs, two Centers for Advanced Technology. This second one being uh, around flexible medical devices and being led by, by Mark Pollux. Uh, our, our longest uh, held national center, the Dirk Center, the Developmental Exposure Alcohol Research Center, was renewed. It got another five-year renewal, and I got to thank Linda Spear and Terry, Terry Deke for working on that proposal and bringing that home. And did I mention that Stan Whittingham won <laughs> the 2019 Nobel Prize in Chemistry? It sounds good. But there was a bump in the road last year. And we learned a lot from that bump in the road. We had certainly a fiscal difficulty. And that's one of the reasons why we moved the time and the date of this presentation to after we have all the official enrollment numbers in. Nazarene is here. She will verify that we have all the official enrollment numbers in. And we know how much revenue has been paid by those students because that was the problem last year. We knew how many students we had. But the mix in state, out of state, graduate, undergraduate, full-time, part-time wasn't what we had expected. And we missed by a long way. And so we had to quickly, quickly come up with a plan in order to, to meet that. And, and I thought, if we can do this, we can do almost everything. We were $13 million short last year for payroll. We spent $8 million of our reserves to cover that. We also got a lot of help from the New York State Legislature. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Fred. Uh, and thank you, Governor Cuomo, for actually appropriating it at the end. I think it might have come out of his side pocket. But we got $5 million in ter for back pay uh, raise money from the state. So it reduced it from $13 million to $8 million that we had to spend out of reserves. But, but when I sent out that memo last year, we're on a hiring hold. I thought it was 13 at that time. We didn't learn that it was going to only be 8 until late, later in the spring. So as you're doing that and you're looking at this shortfall, you say, OK, we have to rethink how we've done business. During the years of SUNY 2020, we were adding growing net faculty every year. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you have to take a, a kind of a U-turn and, and plan differently and have different processes as you're going in the other direction. So we decided to have a hiring hold. Not very popular, but we had a hiring hold and said, look, if you need to hire somebody to replace somebody who just left, you need to get permission. You can't just do it. We need you to think hard. Should that position be, be replaced? Or should you think about reorganizing? And a lot of schools, colleges, units, divisions did reorganizations of offices during that time period. Uh, we delayed our university initiatives, the four university initiatives that came out of the roadmap renewal. We delayed them, kind of put them on hold for, for that period of time. We extended the use of interim positions, uh, specifically the five ones that we had to stop the searches on, the vice president for advancement. The, the chief diversity officer, the dean of Watson, the director of EOP, and the, uh, the dean of students. So we held those as interim positions for a period of year. And we created incentives. We needed some incentives so that the deans could be empowered to say, look, we need to grow our graduate enrollment. I now have an incentive. If you meet our target, if we meet our target, I won't have to take a cut this year. If we beat our target, I will actually get that money back. 100% of that money back. That motivated the dean significantly, and they did a great job. They really worked hard with their departments, and we are in much better shape now. We are not out of the woods. We are in much better shape now, and I thought the best thing to do was two weeks ago, lift the hiring hold, stop the review process, let the deans and the vice presidents manage their budget, budgets like they had in the past, understanding, though, that this could happen again very quickly, uh, and so we want to make sure that you're still using the same kind of fiscal responsibility and fiscal oversight that you did during the one year that we had the hiring hold in place. So where are we now? I think the budget challenges are manageable. Uh, we also got some help from the SUNY Board of Trustees by increasing the undergraduate tuition by $200. 
the academic excellence fee by $150. And so those increases helped us also meet our budget requirements. But the big number, the big improvement was increasing our graduate enrollment across almost the entire university in, in all the different colleges and schools. And we did limit the use of reserve funds, which was good. And a big story was, and I don't think Hari's here. Is Hari in India again? Probably, but Hari Srihari, the Dean of Watson, probably spends more time in India now with some of his faculty and some of his colleague deans doing the recruiting that is necessary, the on-ground recruiting that is necessary to bring students from a very, very intelligent group of students in India to Binghamton University and, and way exceeded our expectations this year for students from India that came here. Wonderful young people who, who love Binghamton University and add a tremendous amount of cultural diversity to the campus as well. So I got to give him a lot of credit for the international recruiting initiatives we did last year. So as I said, we restarted the hiring process and we are starting the searches for those five leadership positions. So I want to thank everybody here because you did it. We did it with hard work. We did it with innovation and we did it with creativity and we will go forward now with a little less austerity than we had in the past and another reason to celebrate, I think. Uh, another big reason to celebrate is 1819 was our best year ever, significantly our best year ever in fundraising. $19.1 million in gifts, 14.2 million of them were in cash, the other five million being in pledges that will come in over multiple years. Uh, some of the really unique donations that we received this year, $1.9 million by Ellen Kashik, class of 65, to establish and to an endow, endow the Institute for Social Justice for Women and Girls. And Susan Strail will be the founding director of that institute. A wonderful gift by Ellen and a wonderful person. She came here for the, the launch of that program and she's gonna be a, a great partner. Uh, was a faculty member at, at uh, San Jose State and studied this, this field for her entire, entire career. Uh, Professor John Eich, who passed away just this last year, left us a million dollars for a grant to foster graduate chemical research beyond expectations, so supporting our graduate students in chemistry, uh, a fund that is well used by the, the department chair and the department uh, members there. And Marilyn Link, again, uh, sad to lose Marilyn last year at the age of 92, uh, but left us in her will more than a million dollars. And that million dollars, she gave us the ability to move where we thought it would be best used. And as we're building this new building in Johnson City for the nursing school, the second floor will have a, a, um, a simulation center. And that simulation center, with the generous, extremely generous support of the Decker Foundation, will now also have an endowment to help manage its operating expenses uh, courtesy of Marilyn Link's estate. The last bullet is kind of interesting too. In the last two years, thanks to our development officers, who many of them are here today, we received 13 $1 million or greater gifts in the last two years. And five years prior, I'm sorry, five total in prior history. Now that doesn't say that we weren't good in the past. That just says that our alumni are getting to the point where they can give away a million dollars. And that's important to know. We have 140,000 alumni. Only 3,500 of them have passed away. And the rest of them are probably still in their mid-40s and mid-50s. So we are just capitalizing on the success of our students and our alumni, the great education that they had here, and the successes that they're having. We've got to keep them proud of us. We have to make sure that they, they read good things about us. Maybe they actually have heard that Stan Whittingham won the Nobel Prize. What's new in Johnson City? Uh, our mayor is here, maybe he could tell us better than I can, but a lot of things are happening in Johnson City. We welcome the third cohort of pharmacy students. Doctor of Pharmacy is a four-year program, so the third cohort means there's one more cohort. And then in 2021, we'll have our first graduation of the students there. We, we beat, we exceeded our target for students in this cohort. I think we had 91 or 92, with a target of 90 students in that third cohort class. Uh, in between the nursing building and the, uh, the pharmacy building, there's an empty lot, grass growing there. We're going to be building an R&D building there. Again, thanks to our assemblywoman and our senator, $16 million building will go there specifically for research and development around pharmaceutical drug discovery and investigations. And it will have an entire floor that is shelled out for industry partners. 
and another floor that is dedicated to the faculty in the pharmaceutical sciences uh, department in the School of Pharmacy. Uh, it'll be a great building, very state-of-the-art building. And then if you go down the street, down Corliss, you'll run into the old Ozolid building. That's a yellow brick building. We've purchased that building. Uh, it's, it's not in bad shape. It hasn't been used in a long time. It was a factory. It made, it made paper for the paper industry or for the photographic industry. It's a perfect place if somebody wanted to create manu a manufacturing facility there. And the state has given us $11 million to attract an industry partner to do the renovations for that building and hopefully actually perhaps manufacture a pharmaceutical component that is designed and developed inside our School of Pharmacy. That's the big dream. That's the big dream for it. Private investments are occurring in Johnson City, and, and Greg knows this as well. You've got the Sunrise Century project that's uh, right across the street from us. You've got the Grand Avenue and Willow Street project. You've got a lot of interest around Lester, Lester Avenue properties. And uh, just over the border into Binghamton, so I look at Mayor David, is the Emma Street project, the Ansco Camera Factory, which has been completely renovated by an, an outstanding developer from Syracuse, and it's occupied. A lot of our students are living there now as well. Uh, you should, if you drive by it, you'll, you'll be very impressed. So by the fall of 2025, we predict that we'll have more than 1,900 students, faculty, and staff working and learning in the Health Sciences campus. That's the plan. That's the goal, and that probably will happen by 2025. I know I've made promises about numbers in the past that haven't always come true, but this one I think we have a lot of uh, a belief that this will happen. And imagine this compared to what we did in downtown Binghamton where we put about 600 students in downtown Binghamton in CCPA and 20 Holly Street and the Twin Rivers uh, apartments grew out of there. Imagine what can happen in Johnson City with all those students over there. So I've been using the term school of nursing. Well, as you add new programs, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and, uh, and uh, speech language pathology, you need to actually create new schools. You have to create a school of applied health sciences and a school of rehabilitation sciences. And we also are going to be building a clinic in Johnson City. When you have all those schools, you can't have the schools be part of a school. You have to have the schools be part of a college. So our decision to change the name of the school to a college said, well, Decker's been such a great supporter of us. Over $10 million has been given by the Decker Foundation over the lifetime of their foundation fund. Uh, let's just call it the Decker College of Nursing and Health Sciences uh, and, and relabel it as the, the college for Decker. And I, I went to ask the board of directors of the Decker Foundation and they said, thank you, we'd love that. And so it's a great partnership that we've had for many years with the Decker Foundation. One of the big benefits of being in Johnson City with health sciences programs is that you get to work in interprofessional teams. We'll have social work students there, pharmacy students, nursing students, public health students, and even upstate medical students. Most of you know, or some of you might not know, that we have a partnership with UHS with our nursing program and our pharmacy program. Upstate medical has a partnership with UHS for their MD program. And so those third and fourth year MD students are down here working in UHS, doing their clinical rotations. They're here, they live here. And they interact and they get trained in interprofessional education teams with our pharmacy students and nursing students because the, medical, the, the upstate medical students that would be interprofessional education opportunities aren't here. So that's a great opportunity, another real big reason why we decided to move uh, as much as we could into Johnson City. And we're doing a lot of good things, I believe, on the Vestal campus, although it is a little of a bit of a problem when you got eight major projects, multi-million dollar projects going on simultaneously. Uh, the engineering building, the exterior cladding, great improvement, but it's not just the look. It, what's inside that building is being improved as well. The exterior cladding allowed us to put new windows and new insulation in. We're going to save over $100,000 a year in energy in the engineering building just from that exterior cladding and insulation. The library renovations, we're in the programming phase of, the re of renovating the third floor of Bartle Library, 40,000 square feet filled with books, and we know that students would rather sit in there and study and work in teams than walk stacks. So we're gonna be redesigning that so it'll be more accessible to student workspaces uh, and finding other locations for those books that are not as rapidly uh, used. Uh, science 2, demolition and construction, you've probably seen. What's going on with Science 2? 
completely gutted from the inside out. Uh, a new skin is going to be put on there as well, just like the engineering building, a little different color. Again, improving the energy efficiency of that building. All of these are provided from the SUNY Construction Fund, mostly because we have a great team of professionals here who serves up pre-designed projects to the SUNY Construction Fund while all the other SUNY campuses are trying to figure out how to, how to spend their money that they've been given, they can't do it. They actually give us some of the money that can't be spent at other campuses. So we have $50 million that we're going to be looking for for the Barta Library project. Uh, the engineering building, more than $25 million in, invested there. The Hinman Dining Hall addition, which is actually being paid by Sodexo, uh, a, a multi-million dollar project. Cleveland Hall, part of Hinman, a renovation project there. And then the University Union basement renovations, which will add more flexible space, open space for student uh, use in the, in the basement. And there's a, a good website, if you ever want to know more about these projects, that gets updated on a regular basis uh, with construction news and also some dates of completion of these different projects. So as I mentioned, we put our university initiatives on hold, but we are restarting them. The Health Science Campus really wasn't put on hold. It was a construction project that just kept going through that period of time. The Health Sciences core facilities, the big idea in there was a brain and body imaging center that would require the purchase of a very expensive MRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. We have a partnership that we're building with UHS where they would actually locate the MRI that we would be purchasing. And we are hoping that uh, the Regional Economic Development Council will help us purchase that locate that MRI inside the actual place where the, the MRIs are done for patients, but then use it for research in the off hours. A great partnership with UHS and will cost us almost nothing other than providing the piece of equipment. Uh, the data science and the data science TAE have kind of been merged together and they've been working on developing a secure computing labs. We've given them a, a, a million to $2 million budget for capital. Uh, Niazi Badur has been leading that group on the staff side and, and the faculty are participating with him to come up with what, what kind of space needs do we need, what kind of computational facilities do we need. The security of data, especially in the healthcare field, is critical. And how do you protect that data? And that's probably going to be the major expenditure that will come out of that initiative this year. And they also have some seed grant money for research projects. And remember, the data science initiative is to find areas of data science where it's not being used. So it's not just focused on the traditional things we think about is when you Google something and, and it comes up so quickly uh, using data science methods. It's looking at other things uh, in the education world, perhaps. And then our postdoctoral diversity program that we had started and we had brought in two cohorts of postdoctoral pre-faculty members who were embedded in different departments. And then along came Prodigy and Prodigy, if there's, if you, you go to our FAQ page, you'll, you can learn more about it. The Prodigy program was something that our chancellor really wanted to get started. She wants to hire 1,000 underrepresented minority faculty over the next 10 years across all of SUNY. And we put in a proposal this past summer, and it's been approved by SUNY, which kind of gives us a, 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 a hunting license to go out and hire as many faculty as we can within these categories. And if we are successful, they will pay almost all of the first year salary half of the second year salary, and about a third of the third year salary. So it's a replacement for the postdoctoral fellow program, but I think it's actually better because it's going to be hiring faculty right into tenure track positions rather than into postdoctoral positions, which was our university initiative. So what's next? You've got you to have some things. All those other things aren't done. Lots to do on those other slides. But what's next? One of the things we've talked about a lot in, in the steering committee for the roadmap is this Carnegie classifications. Carnegie classifications for research are one where we are there, but there's also a Carnegie classification for community engagement. So we put, the, and there's about 300 universities in that classification, and we're not. And it just doesn't make you feel good when you see Stony Brook in something and we're not. But it's also a good thing. It shows that we are engaged with our community. Not just that we go that way, but they come this way. And, and we're putting together a team to figure out how can we do this. It's, it's not an easy process, but, but we think it's, it's worthwhile. We had a great camp, we had a great year in fundraising, $19.1 million. Uh, we are going to start a campaign. We're kind of in the second year or third year of a silent phase. We'll go public when we get about halfway to our goal. 
our goal is flexible, but right now we think in seven years we could raise $150 million. We've raised about 50 so far. So if we can get to $75 million in the next six to 12 months, which is a lot of money, but if we can do that extra $25 million, we will announce a campaign and go public. The goal is probably next fall, uh, and in, so in the meantime, it's a secret. Right. How do you keep a campaign secret when you're asking people for money? It's hard. It's really hard. Uh, the innovation, I'm sorry, a master plan for the fine arts building. Where's our fine arts people? All right. Long overdue. Long overdue. Uh, a regular patron of many of the theaters in there. Love them, love the students, but we know that they all need work. Uh, we're doing a little bit of work with dance floors right now, but we need a master plan for the entire building. We have some tremendous visual arts, uh, performing arts, theater, dance, uh, cinema. I'm missing some things, but music, yeah, I knew I was missing some things, that are, that are just outstanding in fine arts. And then there's some concepts, perhaps, that maybe we could create a school of fine arts. Uh, which I think would be an outstanding idea because I think the departments are, are working well together right now, so maybe this would give them some extra effort to, to move forward with uh, more alumni relations. But they need a master plan. They need a better building. And so we'll be spending the next year putting together a plan. We don't have the money yet. But if we get a good plan together and we bring that to SUNY, the money will flow, and it will be an, a big project. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, the Innovation Lab, this has been something that we've been doing kind of in uh, James's uh, Center for Learning and Teaching space, but we really need a space. This is a program that Upender Dillon and James put together a couple of years ago. Small groups of students, about 25 in a class, maybe 30 or 40 now. There's two cohorts. Did we start our third cohort, James? Not yet. Not yet. So we're still in our second cohort of students. These are open-ended problem-solving sessions where students are proposed with problems and they start to think about how can I solve that problem and it's a four-year engagement with the, or three-year engagement with these students sophomore junior and senior year and they need a physical space and we're, we're working in partnership with the library perhaps there's some space in the library that makes sense for that and as I mentioned we are launching OT occupational therapy physical therapy and speech language pathology programs and two other projects that are just one one still in the drawing board a welcome center you know as you, as you drive in Bartle Drive oh did you see the big sign that says Stanley Whittingham won the Nobel Prize and then you go underneath that sign and on the right there's this little shack uh, that's sort of our welcome center we need something that's a little more sophisticated than that a little more aesthetic than that so we have some ideas of how we could build a welcome center maybe tucked around the corner there in that in that parking lot that is almost always empty just to let you know that lot is almost always empty if you're looking for parking um, but that would be a great addition I think if we could find some funding for that and the living building the living building at Nuthatch Hollow I know there's a lot of people in the audience who've actually spent time up there with with shovels and, and uh, post hole diggers and moving equipment. And I see Carl right here because we've both been up there trying to work as much as we possibly can before we start going to bid and bringing in contractors to do some of the work for the living building at Nuthatch Hollow, which was a donation to us by the Schumann fa family who've been generously supporting that work so far. So things, looking ahead, things to do. I really think 1819, even with that bump in the road was successful. And I want to also say that the bump in the road made it even more successful because we met a challenge. We ran into a challenge. Almost overnight, we ran into a challenge, a big challenge. We put our minds to it. We worked hard. We all worked together. Like Stan says, there's no fiefdoms here. Everybody has to work together. And we solved that problem. Remember, we're not completely out of the woods, but we're pretty close to being out of the woods. I think that is an accomplishment in itself, even though when it happened, it, w it felt like um, um, a bad thing, but it really wasn't. It turned out to be a good thing because we saw that challenge. So what's the future hold? We don't know, uh, but we do know that if it's gonna have some challenges and opportunities, we have to make the best of them and we have to take them to our advantage. So thank you. There's an FAQ page now. If you go to binghamton.edu, slash FAQ. There's some questions that have already been posed, proposed there about Prodigy, about our budget. So if you go there and you want to ask a question, just enter the question in. It comes to me and a couple of people in my office and we will write an answer to those questions and post them or perhaps write you right back directly. Uh, you can email me, hstanger at binghamton.edu. 
Oh, and tomorrow, 3 o'clock, right here in this building, it's going to be full, 1,200 people will be here to celebrate Stan Whittingham and his winning of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Thank you very much.